This is going to be a talk about Ceph. It's going to work is I'm going to do some slides on like what Ceph is, how it works on sort of a very abstract view, and then I'm going to demo a little bit of like how you can use Ceph and like we'll write some, we'll make some files happen and we'll see that they happen. Um, it's exciting. I'm excited. Yeah. You should be. Um, so, first of all, can I get a show of hands of like who is familiar with like what object storage is? Or, or is familiar with like Amazon S3, you might not know what that is like under the hood, but okay. Um, who is familiar with what like the concept of distributed storage is? Okay, cool. So we got lots of people who know, know what's going on. Um, so to get started, uh, distributed storage basically means you have lots of disks. More importantly, you have lots of machines. Um, you can have lots of disks on a single machine. You wouldn't really consider that distributed because you can do that with things like RAID or volume groups. Um, but when you get lots of machines, that's when things get a little crazy and you have to start doing things on a higher level and it gets, yeah, it gets kind of messy. Um, and usually you'll have replication within that distributed storage system um, so that if you lose a machine out of like 50 or whatever, or whatever which is pretty likely because if you have 50 machines, Probably some point where one of them is going to disappear. You don't want all of that data to just disappear with it. Um, cool. So Ceph is a distributed storage um, solution, which is kind of a buzzword term. It's software that does distributed storage for you. Um, the, the Ceph cluster is made of three basic daemons. Um, and so this runs on Linux um, above, above the uh, operating system, if anybody is wondering. Um, you have three main daemons. You have monitor daemons, which are, they basically just check the health of the cluster. They like ping things and they're like, are you still there, all right? How's, how's all this going? Um, OSD daemons, which stands for, or that's probably redundant, yeah. It's, I shouldn't have an extra daemons there. OSD, which stands for object storage daemon. Um, which actually makes the writes and makes like make sure that your data exists and exists in multiple places. Um, and then finally, you have metadata server daemons, which those aren't required for Ceph. Um, if you want to use something called CephFS, which I'm going to talk a little bit more later, you need metadata server um, daemons, but you don't actually need them if you don't want to use CephFS. Um, and yeah, so that that makes it so that you can present um, basically a file system. It, it manages things like, like your metadata that you would expect from like a POSIX file system, which is like perms, um, the hierarchy of like the, the tree, the directory tree, um, ownership, mod time, stuff like that. Yeah, cool. So Ceph uses, uh, Ceph builds a cluster and the cluster ends up being called Rados. That's an acronym for something. I don't remember what it is. Something, 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 object storage. Um, basically, it's, it's object storage. So Rados, um, you, can, you can give Rados a file. It'll put it somewhere. And the, the file will get put somewhere as what's called an object. I'll refer to it as an object a lot. Um, but when it hits disk, it, it ends up as a file currently. Yeah. Um, when, when you write to Ceph, when you, when you say like, hey, put this file somewhere, it will put, it, it uses some hashing algorithm to be like, okay, where does this go? Um, and it decides what placement group that object belongs in, um, which is just sort of a grouping, a logical grouping of like, all of these things are grouped together in one place. Um, and then all of your OSDs have a list of what placement groups that they are responsible for. So when, if, if you have an OSD, we'll call it OSD1, and its placement groups are like five, six, seven, and you write an object to five, you'll write to OSD1 because it knows like, hey, that's, send that to me, I'll deal with it, I'll put it on disk. And then, yeah, and then, so this is the problem, yeah, above, above, whatever. Um, when you write to the OSD, if you have, um, depending on how you have replication set up, the OSD that is the primary for that placement group it then figures out where it needs to replicate to. So your client runs to, writes to one place, that place then writes out to the cluster and is like, hey, you need this data, you need this data, tell me when you've written it down, 
And then once those act back to it and it's written it down, it acts back to the client. Um, and how that works is the client talks to the monitors. Oh, what's up? Um, except for its redundancy, right? Like multiple the right players. Yeah. Like a, a what is this, do you know how this works with, when you have like if you're got two different copies of an object stored somewhere? What, sorry, say that again? Do you know how this changes or like how, how it works differently if you have multiple copies of all your data? So that's how this that's how this works. So you write to your OSD that has your primary placement group, and then that OSD uses an algorithm called crush. And it figures out, all right, for this placement group, these, if it, let's say you want three copies of a piece of data, right, which is sort of the minimum that you want. Um, it says, all right, I need to write this two other places. It uses a, an algorithm called crush, and it says, all right, I need to write to this OSD, and I need to write to this OSD. And then those act back to it when, when they're done writing. Once it's done writing, it will act back to the client. What's up? Object storage daemon. So that's a daemon that writes to disk, basically. It, you give it files, it writes to disk. And it also replicates to other OSDs. Um, from a client standpoint, what this looks like is you talk to the monitors and you say, hey, what, what does the cluster look like? Um, and it, it, give, it gives you back a bunch of metadata of like, these are the OSDs you have. This is where all the placement groups are. And then, when, when the client wants to write data, it uses crush again, and it says it, it, it does some sort of hashing of the data or something, and it figures out, all right, this data needs to go to this OSD, and it writes directly to that OSD. It's also important to note that OSDs are generally one per disk, so you can have, if you have a machine with 20 disks, you'll probably have 20 OSDs. What's up? I'm sorry, when you say client, are you talking about like a user application? Yeah, so it could be the Linux kernel, it could be like, uh, KVM, Kimu. Um, so the user application is in charge of hashing the OSIS subsystem? Uh, well, yeah, so the, it uses the same algorithm on the client side. So the client figures out where it can write, where it needs to write to directly, because then you don't have to go through a, you, you end up getting um, bottlenecks if you, if you have to write to a single point, right? Um, if you can write to the machine that you need to write to directly, then you avoid network bottlenecks and stuff. But theoretically, bad things could happen. Like I should, I could decide to change my hashing algorithm in the middle without, in the middle of using a set inside the set. Uh, I mean, <laughs> in in theory, but like, why would you want to do that? Right, you're just breaking your cluster at that point. Right. Yeah, which th so there's something called. Um, Librados is probably the piece that does this. Um, it's, it's the Ceph client end that is written by the Ceph guys. That, um, it, it, you basically talk to it, and it talks to the cluster. Um, and the Linux kernel has, has stuff built in so that it can talk to Ceph and stuff. Um, yeah, cool, is that? Uh, sorry, uh, so I want a block device. What do we have right now? We just have, we're giving it files. We're just sending. We're, we're throwing yeah. files at it like like S3 basically. Okay, so we we throw in a file and then we're like, I want that file back. And exactly. Like, okay. Yeah, with exactly like S3. So I have to like talk API to get files and get, put files. In yeah, there. or it could it could be some sort of like HTTP. Like it could end up on like an Apache somewhere or something that you just download from Apache. Um, okay. In fact, the let me move on a bit maybe. Yeah. So RGW. This is the Rados gateway, which is basically just a way that you talk to Rados. And so Rados takes uh, file sizes that are all the same across the whole cluster. Um, and that's configurable. So default is four megabytes. So whenever you want to write to Rados, you write a four megabyte file. Rados gateway will take your bigger files, break them up into smaller files, and then write them to Rados. Uh, like S3, so that it actually adheres to the S3 API, so all of the tools that you use with S3, you can point at a Ceph cluster and be like, go do your thing and it'll just work. Um, also works with OpenStack's, uh, or used to work with OpenStack Swift API, I don't know how well supported that is anymore, I heard talk um, that that wasn't really well supported anymore. Um, but yeah, so RGW, which is, we're, we're getting to, to your block device thing. Um, RGW just looks like S3. You, you throw a file at it, it breaks it up into smaller files that you can write to Rados. RBD, this is, this is what you want. This is another abstraction that, oh, what's up? Uh, before we go to objects, um, or to the block device, the object store supports things other than files, is that correct? Like you can do event queues and stuff in it? 
Or am I thinking of something else? I don't think so, no. Yeah, you might be thinking of something else. Um, so this is, is a little bit more complicated than RGW, so it does a bit more. And this is basically, it translates all the files that live in Rados into a block device. Um, if I think S, uh, Amazon has also built something on S3 like this, because I remember the, the last outage that they had, there were a bunch of people that were like, my volumes disappeared because they were all on S3, or like they were down or whatever. Um, this is very common to use in OpenStack for Cinder volumes. Um, I think it's actually the most, uh, there's like user graphs, it's, it, I think it's the most used um, Cinder backend for redundant disks. Um, and it also supports copy and write. So if you have, if you have a block device, if you want to replicate that, you can do that for free, basically. Um, until you start writing to it, then you, that starts costing data. Um, this is really useful. This is what we, oh, I don't think I, I mentioned. I, I'm a volunteer at the Computer Action Team. This is why I've been messing with Ceph. We're using this in our Gennady, or we're going to be using this in our Gennady Cloud. Um, that's what I've been working on for a while. Um, yeah, so this is what we're going to be using pretty extensively. And then, finally, CephFS, which is an, another different abstraction layer of, like, you have a bunch of things in Rados. Let's build a file system out of it. And this works a lot like NFS. Like, you just mount it over the network. Um, it's not secure, much like NFS. Um, the only security is that clients authenticate with a key. The, all the data going over the network is not encrypted. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of awful from a security standpoint, but it's no worse than NFS. What's up? If your clients are authenticating with a key. Do you have um, like uh, what's the word? do you have like validation of the traffic? Like how, if if you're using if, like cryptographic tools to authenticate who you are at the beginning of like a transaction uh -huh. across the file system, but then the stuff isn't encrypted, how do you know that the that your client hasn't like been replaced or whatever? Pray. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, that's way over my. Right. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is. It's a lot like NFS, but it. It's not only the network share. It's. Um, it's also the underlying file system. Um, and it's POSIX compliant. Um, this is the part of the stuff that's not been production ready for the longest time. It's, they've sort of been like, this is going to be a thing, guys. Don't use it that yet. Don't use it yet, though, because it'll lose your data. Um, <laughs> and then as of like the last long-term re uh, release, which was about a year ago, um, called Jewel, um, they were like, it's finally ready. Like, Put your data on it. We're not going to lose it, promise. Um, yeah. Cool. Oh, that's the end of my slides. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is that when OSDs... Yeah, so this, this is kind of complicated, but it's, I find it interesting. When OSDs write, what they actually do is they have a, a, they have a journal, and they have an, usually it's an XFS file system. And the XFS file system is where the data ends up as, like the objects end up as files. The journal is how it makes sure that they, it, it, that's how it keeps the data consistent and like actually make sure like, hey, I actually wrote this. Um, yeah, it's kind of complicated. There are problems where like, I'm gonna draw a thing. Um, so, and I might get this wrong. So when you write to an OSD, let's say this is your OSD, that's awful. Um, so the OSD gets the data, it, it writes off to, this is going to be XFS, it, set, it tells XFS like, hey, write this file, and XFS is like, all right, dude, did it, but it totally didn't. Um, and so it also writes to a block device raw and says, I'm, I'm writing this here, I'm going, this is gonna end up here eventually, but like it's definitely here and this is the data that should be here. So whenever you lose your OSD, if XFS had that cached and didn't actually write it down, it looks at the journal and is like, it checks all the things that it thinks it should have 
And if it sees that it doesn't have them, it's like, all right, that write didn't actually happen. Let me go talk to the other OSDs that made that write. Or actually, no. It, all of the data is, is in the journal. So it, it's able to play back. And if it sees that the file isn't here, it can grab it out of the journal and put it in XFS. It's kind of complicated. This also varies very widely because there are a bunch of different OSD drivers where like this can be replaced with like ButterFS, but much like old CephFS, it'll lose your data. Um, <laughs> and they're they're working on they're working on a, a driver here where they actually just this ends up as a raw block device, and this is a database. So they have a database that is their journal, and they write to a raw block device, which which solves the like caching issue of like, I, I told X, XFS to write this, but did it write it? Uh, um, yeah. Cool. That's important to know about OSDs because like, there's big performance hits there if you don't know about that and you don't know what you're doing. Um, Can Rados do duplication? So like I write my file to Rados and then I write it to two or three different devices? Yes. Devices. So in fact, I can show that. Yeah. So that. When it so this is the the right the yeah this is the the right procedure but when it when it starts doing this it also tells two other however many other OSDs that you have config to like hey also write these things and then they do the same thing on themselves is like and, and can it do that intelligently so like it puts one on this network and another yes on that, that, that you network. can do granularity of like hey these are two different rooms. I want one copy in this room, or at least one copy in this room, and at least one copy in this room. Or like, these are two different networks, or these are two different racks. I want like two pieces of this data on two different racks, so that if one catches fire, the data's somewhere, I promise. Um, it's actually, it's really cool, the granularity that we can get to. Um, we, um, but I, the only, the, by default, it just duplicates across nodes. Um, that's all that I'm interested in. Um, I don't have a use case for more than that. Um, um, so this, you probably can't see that. Um, this is a hypervisor running some OSDs. So if we want to see what the health of our uh, status of our cluster is, we can see, hey, so our health is OK. It tells us a bunch of metadata, so our mon map, which is the monitors that we have. Um, we have three of them, KVM Andromeda, KVM Milky Way, and KVM Triangulum. Um, election Epoch, which is, yeah, it's how the monitors are deciding, like, they're, how they're talking to each other and stuff. Um, FS map, that's your metadata servers. I don't know what the 111 is. I think that's, like, what you have allocated, what's up and what's in or something. I don't know. Um, OSD map, so we have six OSDs, all of them are running, and all of them are in the cluster. So there is a way to, to be like, hey, this, this daemon's going to run, but don't use it. And so what you'll see there is you'll see like six up, five in. Uh, flags, those are things for like defining how the OSD works. Um, PG map, this is um, metadata about what our PGs, the health of our PGs. Um, 400 active, so we have 400 total PGs. We have 400 active and clean, which is good. Um, I could, well, hmm. I don't really want to break things. <laughs> but I can, I don't know. This isn't really production yet. You <laughs> would. Um, my, my lead's laughing back there. <laughs> um, so so this, is, this is like the, the, the great, like, I need some metadata. Tell me about the cluster. This is a great start of, like, things are going wrong. What's happening? Um, cool. So if we want to see a little bit about, like, our OSD usage, this is a little bit hard to look at, but it's kind of cool. So what we see here is we have six OSDs, 0, 3, 1, 4, 2, 5. And 0 and 3 live on this machine, 1 and 4 live on this machine, and 2 and 5 live on this machine. If you wanted to do like across racks, what you'll see here is you'll see like rack 2 host KVM Milky Way, and like up here you'll have like rack 1. And so it, it's, it, you nest them basically. Um, 
And weight, we're not really going to talk about that. Reweight, we're not going to talk about that either. Um, size, that's how big the, the disk is that the OSD can write to. So each of these are 1.8 terabyte disks. Um, usage, so each of them are around 30 gigabytes used. Um, and then available is just size minus usage. Uh, use percentage, um, variation, that's not important. And PGs are how many PGs OSD has. Um, this is also really cool to look at because like, you, can, you can start writing things and you can like, see the numbers grow. Um, that's fun. Uh, so what else is there to look at? So, I are guess those, are those raw disks, or are they set up in a RAID? So actually, neither. So we have we have the the data goes to a raw disk. Our journals are dedicated as well. They're partitions on an SSD. So so the journal uh, writes really fast. Um, which is ideal, and then what, when data hits the slow disk, like that happens eventually, but it, it, it's slower, so we have the, the SSDs to make things faster. Um, so really, it's, each of these is a pair of a 1.8 terabyte um, spinning disk as the data store, and then like a 30 gigabyte partition on an SSD as the journal. Um, you generally... Uh, you generally don't want to do like RAID stuff under Ceph. Um, yeah. What's the minimum size that's practical? Is it when you use for just three hosts and just two DMs per host? Uh, no. So if you want replication, you want at least three. You want at least three copies of a thing. Um, if you have two copies of a thing, there's no way to know which copy is right. Um, that's a thing that, like, don't screw that up. That's, that's awful. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, you, you need to be able to tell, like, we have two copies of a thing, they're different. I don't know which one's right because I don't have a third copy to be the decider. Um, Another question, how much latency can this thing tolerate? Could I run this in New York City, San Francisco, and Singapore as my three hosts, or would it go insane? You would not do that, that would be bad. Um, <laughs> what you can do is you could run like three clusters and then you can do like cluster um, replication or something. Like there's a way to be like, Instead of, instead of doing your OSDs across like, a bunch of different data centers, you can have multiple clusters, and then you can have those clusters talk to each other. And, and so basically what happens is you say, like, I want one right to go to like, China, and, and everything else is in New York or whatever. It'll only wait for the New York rights to finish for, for it to send an act back to the client. I think that's how that works. And then it'll, it, it'll send stuff off to China, but it's not waiting for it because that's going to take a while. Uh, no, that would be even like a higher level of like a whole different cluster. So you wouldn't even be able to look at. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'm pretty sure. I haven't. I. This is all from reading. Like that's that's reading docs. So I don't actually. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's that's a cool thing to look at. Um. I guess we can like. Oh yeah, let's let's turn off a, a daemon. Um, what could go wrong, right? Um, Ceph dash OSD at zero dot service. This is terrifying. Live demos, guys. <laughs> I was gonna ask if you actually had done this. Have you tested, you know, an outage and what kind of issues have you run lately? Like? What if you lose two out of your three, and how you recover from it's that? It's actually impressively smart. Of like, it'll it'll figure things out. Um, so now we'll see. So if I do Ceph status, uh, yeah, cool. So we have five up because I just turned one of them off. Six in because I it hasn't been marked out yet. So that it. If an OSD goes down, Ceph will wait five minutes before marking it out. Um, so I'm just going to mark it out. Uh, set out. Is that? No, that's not right. <laughs> Ceph OSD out, maybe? <coughs> cool. Um, yeah, so now it's like, it's gone. What? Yeah, exactly. So now we can see we got some recovery out. We got 349 megabytes per second, and it's like 
hey, all this data that was on this disk that's now gone, we gotta put it somewhere. Um, and so you'll see, or Cephos DDF tree, this, this disk now has way more placement groups because it's picking up all the placement groups off of this one and, and it's taking them and being like, hey, this is my data now. Um, and the reason it has to do that is because we have replication set to three. Um, and so every, every node basically has to have a copy of the data. And so it can't take the data that was here and put it here because then you would have like two copies of the same data on the same machine and that's just bad. Um, so yeah, we'll see and it's, I don't see the usage. Um, so status. And we can actually do like a watch. That's hard to look at though. Never mind. That was dumb. Um, is the usage climbing? Oh, it is. Cool. Yeah. So it's actually doing shit. Like it's 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 realized that its OSD is gone, and it's like, hey, I gotta fix that. Um, and at this point, if if you had if all of your clients have to go grab. I don't, they end up having to get a new um, cluster map because now your OSD is gone and they, they have to figure out, like, I thought I was supposed to write to OSD zero, but that's gone. So now it, it grabs a new map and is like, figures out where it actually has to write. Um, I'm going to, I mean, that's kind of all that that does. I don't really want to wait for that to happen. Um, system CTL start sf osd at zero. And now if we do a Ceph status, we should see five up, six up. So now we see six up and five in, because the daemon is running. Oh, and also something that's cool to see is we have 266 PGs that are healthy, and then we have a bunch of other things in various states of like, hey, undersized, degraded, remapped, weight backfill, Undersized, degraded, active, remapped. Yeah, it's we got all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so now, if I set it back in, post uh, in zero, it should basically immediately realize that things are good. Maybe. Yeah. So it's it's cleaning up really quickly. Um, yeah. So that's that's what the fault tolerance <coughs> looks like. Like you lose a disk, and it's like right. But I got that chip. Um, another thing to note is that Ceph does let you say like, hey, I, I don't want you to set any OSDs as out. Yeah. The OSDs are gonna disappear, maybe you're patching, you're gonna reboot, it's gonna take longer than five minutes. Don't recover, it's gonna come back, I promise. You can do that, so like, it, it lets you, and that, that might be useful to, to avoid the unnecessary network IO or whatever that, that the recovery is going to cause when your data is going to come back in like a couple minutes anyways. Um, yeah, it's still figuring things out. Um, but yeah, so that's what the fault tolerance looks like. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, I had a question about your uh, Gennady integration. So um, are each of your hypervisors basically running OSDs as well and they're acting? Backstores on that, or do you have a separate storage cluster? No, we're we're doing we're doing OSDs and and uh, hypervisors on the same node. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't have the we don't have the funds, I'll say, to be able to afford to do like a a separate. Yeah, we And, and I'm also curious the, the how you have it integrated in Gennady, like the things you had to set up. With that. So. Own settings for radars and all that. Yeah, Gennady supports Ceph, kinda. It's been broken since the release that we're on. Um, Joule is, it deprecated a flag that Gennady used. There's like a patch waiting, and like I waited for a little bit. And then I wrote an extended storage driver for it, because that's just easier. And like I don't have to wait for other people. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically what ended up happening is like I saw that that was an issue, and I was like, I waited for a bit, and I was like, hopefully this, this will get fixed, but. I, yeah, I, I found like an extended storage driver for Ceph on Google, and I, I like, all right, I need to do a little bit more than this, and I took it, and I just yeah, wrote. published on GitHub. 
I don't. I should. A couple of people have asked, like, yeah. So I, I don't think I mentioned either. I, I work at a company called DreamHost. Um, we do a bunch of Ceph stuff. Ceph actually originated out of DreamHost. Um, and one of my coworkers who, like, I mentioned that we were doing this, he was like, hey, you should, you should show me what that code looks like. Um, but yeah, I can publish that. Um, Ceph has a concept of pools. Sure. I kind of, I don't know, that's kind of weird. They, all data end up in a pool. Um, the pool basically just sets some, some like attributes to that like data. So you can have, you can have two different pools with different numbers of replication, for example. So what's up? Um, so you, sorry, you took it, uh, you set a data that's out. Uh -huh. So it started duplicating the data uh -huh. again. I, I, I mean, it deletes it. it. It probably just is like just starts ignoring, like marks that data is free and recognizes that its data okay. is not supposed. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so pools are basically a way to be able to treat different data differently within the same cluster. So you can have some data that you have five copies of, some data that you have three copies of. Um, we do three copy for everything. Um, uh, another thing is Ceph lets you define how many, so how many copies are ideal? How many copies will you let me keep running with? <coughs> so we have it set, so we'll keep, we'll keep running if we have two copies of a piece of data. Things, things will stop, Ceph will, will stop serving clients um, when there's only one copy of a piece of data. <coughs> Ideally it will have three. Um, that's that's an interesting thing to know about because like, what happens when you lose an OSD and you only have two copies of a thing? Like if you have it set up wrong, your client IO will just stop. Um, but it, it lets you configure to be like, hey, two copies is fine, not ideal, but keep keep working. Um, yeah. Uh, so now we can. I'm gonna look at RBD. Oh, what's up? Uh, so like you've architected your thing, you have three nodes, mm -hmm. uh, and then you want to add a new node with like a different size storage. Does it play well with that? Like, yeah, so double the storage and so, not hashing it in. Does, does that work? Remember how I said we weren't going to talk about weight? We're going to talk about weight. We're going to talk about weight. Cool. Um, <laughs> weight is basically, it's a weird number. It's, it's the number of terabytes that an OSD has, 1.8. 1850. So that's the number of terabytes that that OSD has. And so basically, if you were to add another disk that was three, three and a half terabytes, it would just take it and start using it. It would, it would even allocate twice as much data to it as it would a, a disk with half as much data. Uh, yeah. And then how does that work with, like, I want three copies of this to exist? What if you have one node that's just so massive? But the other nodes, does it still try to duplicate across? It'll it'll still it'll still try to do across nodes unless you tell it like, hey, it's fine if, if they're on the same okay. node. Uh, yeah. So yeah. one node doesn't. Would, would that massive node just end up getting underused or overused? It would it would probably get underused if so if if these disks were twice as big as they are, they would get underused because the only way that they can be used is if the other disks are as big because of how we have it set up. Okay. Yeah, because, because of the way that um, each node gets a copy of a, a piece of data. So, yeah, that's so awful at explaining this. Um, does, it, does it kind of make sense why that would get underused? Uh, yes. OK, yeah, it looked like you had a question. Yeah, kind of related. Like, is there a concept of load balancing in a set? Like, if I had a more complex system, where uh, load balancing? Do you mean like network or what? What it's kind of like like balancing storage or sort of? Yeah, balancing storage. Um, yeah, so that's what this reweight thing is that I also said I wasn't going to talk about. Um, that's um, yeah. So this this variation thing where this this disk has 1.05 times the average and this has 0.95 times the average. You can reweight them so that they grab placement groups in such a way that they get a more even spread of data. Does that make sense? So you can tell it like, 
lower lower the amount of um, data that this is getting or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it even it's there's a smart way it like Ceph OSD uh oh, pipe plus. Oh, that's not gonna work. I'm gonna have to wait. Oh, that was what I thought it was. Um there's a reweight by Yeah, so there's reweight by utilization, which basically says like if this OSD has more than is more than like 1.05 times the average OSD, reweight it so that it gets less data and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so it's actually smart and there's built-in tools to make that easier for you. Um, cool. Now we can start talking about the cool stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Um, RBD. So RBD LS. This just shows us the disks that we have. Um, each of these is a, a disk for a Gennady VM. Um, yeah, and then the things that you'll see like CentOS 7 dash server and Ubuntu dash login and Ubuntu dash server are images that I've built and uploaded to Ceph. And then uh, RBD LS dash L. Oh, that's awful. Is that gonna, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so basically a lot of these images or disks are really just copy on write copies of the, the CentOS and Ubuntu things. So they share a lot of the same data. If you have a bunch of different um, RBD volumes and they're all based off of the same image, they'll all use the same base image and then the only thing that you're storing is the difference between the base image and what your actual image is. Um, so that helps save like a lot of, a lot of space. It's also really nice because we can, like, cloning a, an image is almost instantaneous. So when you want a new volume that's based off of, off of an image, you can do that almost immediately, and you can like boot your server right away, um, instead of having to wait for Pixie or whatever, which is how we're doing it currently, because um, we don't have a copy and write solution. Um, but we will soon. Um, yeah, so that's, RBD is really cool. I really, I, I think it's really fancy. Um, the, the copy and write stuff is really useful, especially for reducing um, image creation time, or not image, uh, server creation time. Um, yeah, I don't know what else. I can like RBD clone, uh, let's do this. Um, foo. So that clone was basically immediately, immediate, oh, oh. Wait, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do? It always happens during the demo. I know, it's terrible. You have to make it perfect. So, <laughs> yeah, so now we have this, this volume called foo. And you can see that its parent is this thing that I told it to be based off of. And if we do an RBD DU, oh, it's going to take a bit, isn't it? Um, we'll see that foo is actually using zero data currently because it's just a copy on write copy of the CentOS 7 image. It hasn't started allocating any new data, so it's, it's using zero data. If we tried to boot that, it would boot. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't want to deal with creating VMs right now. Um, RBD RM foo. So that just removes the image. Um, yeah, that's RBD. Is there anything else that's useful to show with RBD? Um, I think that's that's the, the rundown of RBD. Um, Kimu and, well, Kimu supports using RBD directly, so it, it has built in. It uses the libRBD um, library to be able to talk directly to the Ceph server, so it doesn't have to use the kernel. It, it, it doesn't look at it like a block device. It looks at it like a, well, it kind of looks, it looks at it like a block device, but it doesn't look at it like a block device in the kernel. It looks at, at like a block device in uh, Ceph. The, the, the Linux kernel also does support, um, in fact, if we do a plus block pipe plus, 
we can see these RBD things. These are mappings of those RBD volumes that we saw into the kernel so that we can access those devices just as you would like a hard drive like SDA or SDB or whatever, or VDA or VDB. Um, yeah, the, the libRBD stuff tends to be better because it's not dependent on what kernel version you have. If you're on an old kernel version, you get weird things where like new Ceph doesn't, doesn't some of the new Ceph features don't let you, um, don't work with, with older um, kernel uh, RBD. Cool, so that's RBD. Uh, this is perhaps the more, well, that's not interesting. Um, uh, what is it, CephFS LS? Oh, what does that mean? Is it CephFS LS? Ah, cool. So now we're going to talk about CephFS, um, which is the like NFS-like file system. Well, it's network shared. It's not really like NFS. Um, so I have a file system called Dark Shrine. The, the metadata pool is metadata, and the data pool is CephFS. How creative of me. Um, and if we do a Ceph OSD pool LS, we can see that we have metadata and CephFS as two pools. Um, and if I wanted to mount this somewhere, I can do that. Um, I have to give the, the client a key so that it knows how to, well, so that it's authenticated with Ceph. I've already done that because I don't want to do that here on the big screen. Um, so I have this, this machine. This is a VM. Um, ironically, not using Ceph. Um, and this has a key so that it can talk to Ceph. And that is in Etsy Ceph secret. Um, and if I want to mount the Ceph file system on my file system, I can do that. So I have saved this because I, I yeah, I can, that's a long, a long command. It's a hard one. Um, the mount that stuff basically says, hey, when I'm mounting, use, like, be, be sure that you're trying to do a stuff thing. This is the monitor that it's going to talk to. This is the path that it's going to try and mount. That's where it's going to mount it to. Dash O just means I have some options. Name equals canon. Um, when it tries to use um, the, the key, it needs to know what the key name it's trying to use is. So that's what that is. Um, and the secret file, that's, that's where the key exists. Um, so if I copy that and I run that, now we cd slash mnt, we have some things, and if I run mount pipe grep mnt, we see that we have a thing on mount, and it's it's a Ceph thing. Um, it's read write and a bunch of bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, so now now we have a file system that's coming from Ceph. Onto our onto our disk or onto our file system. Um, so what I want to do, uh, DF. Yeah. So this is this this shows how much data each pool is using. This is before replication, so it's really three times each of these. Um, this that gets replicated three times. That gets replicated three times. That gets replicated three times. Um, it, yeah. In some places, it, it tells you what the actual data utilization is. And in some places, it tells you like the, this is how much the client wrote, but it also got replicated in multiple places. You kind of have to just know based on context. Um, um, but the important thing to see is that like our use for CephFS is 9.6 uh, gigs. And if I decide to like dd if equals dev zero of equals um, bar. Um, it'll start writing things. Why? No. Oh, now we see it growing. And actually, I think the reason for that is that for the first five seconds, it was hitting the journal. It wasn't actually landing on the disk. And then, and then as the, the journal fills up um, and it starts to Wash things out, but yeah, so we can see that we're actually writing to the Ceph cluster. Like, that's growing because of the, the zeros that we're writing to a file, which is how exciting. Um, 
I'm not control C that. It's kind of slow. I, it's, it's redundant though. It's kind of nice. Um, so that's the, the time it took to reach all of the nodes, or? Yes, that is, yeah, yeah. So, so Seth won't acknowledge that it's written until it writes everywhere, until, until each OSD says, hey, I've written. And then, and then it's like, all right, it tells the client, I've, I've actually written. What's up? Um, do you know anything about how the latency, like on comparable networks, how the latency compared to the and NFS? Well, so for reads, it's, it's probably negligible because reads, when you do a read, you do a lookup and you say, where is this data? And you talk directly to the OSD and you grab it. Um, for writes, I mean, it really depends. Right, because for the network stuff, I don't actually know. I mean, it it largely depends on like how you've structured your your stuff cluster, because yeah. like things like journals and like how you're doing journaling and how your OSTs work, like all of that is very sensitive um, in in deciding how fast things work. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's some of us. If if I don't know what else there is to like, I can make dir thing. I don't know what else there is to show about Cephas. I can like, I can write more zeros. So have you migrated some of your uh, Gennady instances from DRBD, I'm assuming you're using yeah, that, using to, to this? And if you did, like, how do you do that migration? Or are you just only doing newer stuff? Uh, yeah. You can totally change the design. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, that, so you could use that feature of Gennady to do change this type from. Yeah. Okay. I didn't think that was going to work. I was wrong. I forgot about that. There was an argument. Um, I, ideally, you would redeploy because if you want to take advantage of the copy on write, the, the data that copy on write saves you, you have to redeploy um, and base it off that image. If you don't care about that, then doing a, a disk change is, yeah, it's easy. Um, uh, yeah, that's. That's Seth. I don't know what else. Does anybody have any questions of like how any of this works or like why this? Seth, Seth is really cool. Um, lots of people use it. I heard that like DigitalOcean uses it as a back end of their stuff. I know CERN uses it for a lot of their stuff. Um, I think they have one of the bigger clusters. Uh, it's a Red Hat project now. What's up? Yes, so caching. So you said Placement groups, yeah. It, it, it determines what placement group it lands on. Yes. Yeah. The placement group, so each OSD has a list of placement groups that it's responsible for. And it manages, whenever data gets written to that placement group, the OSD writes that. Um, there, if you, if you want to read about it, the, so Ceph was originally a PhD project. If you want to read about Crush, I'm sure there's a long paper about it that you can find on the internet. Um, yeah. Yeah. I can point you at, at things probably. Um, yeah. But it, yeah. It, Ceph has been going for a long time. Like, I think, I think I heard they started on this in like 2006. Um, and it, it started out as a PhD project. And then DreamHost ended up starting to run it, and then DreamHost spun off a company called Ink Tank to do Ceph support, and then Ink Tank got bought up by Red Hat, um, and now all of the people who are doing that are Red Hat people. Uh, yeah. Yeah, are there any other questions, maybe? Make dirt. That's a good idea. I, I mean, yeah, I should do that. <laughs> Yeah, man. That's. I mean, what else am I gonna write but zeros to a file named derp? <laughs> I could, but that's actually that's probably slower. So that that is slower because dev random will run out of like randomness. It's yeah. It, it won't give you actual performance of the stuff cluster because dev random yeah is not. It doesn't feed your data as fast as yeah. What's up? Uh, so if you use a object or like a file or something. 
Mm -hmm. Will it duplicate it more times so that it doesn't like spread out the load? No, and in fact, all, all reads come from the same place. Okay. All reads always come from the primary OSD. Um, yeah, so that, that does, that's not a thing that happens. It could probably, I mean, it does caching things, I'm sure. Like the kernel <laughs> will do caching things for you. Um, but no, that's, all reads come from the same place. They always come from the primary OSD. And that's part of what crush, like that's, I guess in theory you could have an algorithm that tells you like a list of things that you could grab it from and you like choose at random or something. Crush doesn't do that. Crush tells you what the primary is um, and you read from the primary always. Yeah. Okay. Actually, well, so we have, there's something called, uh, oh, wait, rip, do I need to be, I probably need, oh, no, that works. So this is the, like, very basic, like, monitoring thing, um, of, like, what, what's going on in the cluster, like, how's the PGs doing, what's your cluster utilization, this is kind of dumb, if you want, like, proper monitoring, you would write, like, if you're using Agios or Asynchro, you write, like, a text of, like, is this OSD up or something like that? 